and welcome to another edition of Life is Painful. Um, I'm delighted to uh, sort of reconnect with uh, a dear old friend of mine, Jen. So before we go live, a couple of things, Jen. I, I know you're, you know, you're sort of suffering health-wise, but gen generally, how are things? And let's sort of proceed from where we where we just picked up before we went live about your uh, your editor. So that's a great place to kick off. So without any further ado, how are you doing tonight, Jen? Good, good. I'm I'm so glad to be touching base with you again, and um, yeah, I'm I'm learning so much. You know, I'm I'm doing things that I've never done before, um, and and it's been it's been exciting. And I, you know, I think I just overdid it. I haven't been taking good enough care of myself as a human because you know I've just been on a mission and you know work, 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 and. Uh, and so it's easy to get away from, you know, the the creative me who started all of this in the first place, if that makes sense. So I love touching base with you because in in that way, I'm touching base with myself, you know, my 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 true creative self, not not this, you know, person who's, you know, chasing uh, business ideas, you know. So this is cause it. So, so, so go on, tell, you were literally just about to tell me before we went live about you got a letter from your editor, so kick on, tell me about that as much as that you want to tell. Yeah, no, so it's so exciting and I know that you will appreciate how uh, honoured I was by this and, and what a big deal it is to me. So um, I have been in Virginia for the last two months and I just flew, this last weekend flew back into Colorado Springs to attend a trial that I'm writing about. And um, before I'm, my editor, the, the gentleman who's working with me as, as my editor, he used to work with Hunter Thompson. And in fact, he was a caretaker on Owl Farm in Woody Creek, Colorado um, for a long time. So, you know, he knew the man quite well. And uh, he wanted to send me something before my trip because he knew I was, you know, going, going on this, this assignment to, to write about this trial. And so he sent me the, this letter and I'll just read it. It says, Jennifer, you can see the ink running out when I copied the cover of the Aspen Review. I'll get you a better copy when I buy more ink. The other letter is the one Hunter gave me. It could be a copy, but I doubt it. It's on watermarked paper. The notes file and Clancy are written by Hunter. Thought you might be interested in some of his legal correspondence, you being in that field right now. And, um, and so, I'm not sure how to turn on the camera. Can I? Ah. Okay, so I should be able to. Well, there's my ceiling fan. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, how to switch it so that it's. Uh, anyhow, uh, so this is the letter. Can you see that? Yep. Yeah, so it's on Rolling Stone letterhead that says Dr. Hunter S. Thompson, National Correspondent, and it's dated June 28th, 1978, and it's got the, uh, it's got the watermark, and, um, and when you feel it, you can feel the impressions from his typewriter, and, um, I mean, wow, I, I just, uh, you know, and I, I won't read the whole letter, but you can imagine, you know, getting a, a piece of paper that, um, how do I get the camera back off here? <laughs> I'm, I'm learning. Okay. Uh, you can imagine how honored I was by that because uh, most, most of, I, I mean, I've, I've learned so much. He, Hunter Thompson really left a blueprint and, um, and, and there's so much to be learned there. And so the idea that, you know, right before I'm getting ready to travel to go uh, cover this thing that's happening in court, um, you know, it's, it's a letter that Hunter Thompson, you know, typed himself. So basically what he would do is he would type out sort of a draft and, um, and then if there was a mistake, he would go back over that word with the letters M and N over and over to cross those out. And so I actually see that, you know, in this letter. So he would type it up and then he would hand it over to somebody else. And, and then, you know, they would type a cleaner copy that actually got sent. 
And so this one is a letter that he wrote to an attorney friend named John. And, and really what it's about, the letter is about um, arguing for, uh, you know, film rights for fear and loathing and, and also the, the ordeal with uh, Universal. Uh, you, there was a there was a big thing with Universal because, you know, originally, um, like on um, where the Buffalo Room, there there was supposed to be all this music, and and all of the music got got taken out because it didn't make enough money for Universal. So uh, it's just, I just find it incredibly interesting, and it's one of the coolest gifts I've ever received. Do you know what's fascinating about that, Jen? It's like, it's like that we've touched base Facebook before, but it's not something I've been contemplating. I sent you a piece across the last couple of days. But the difference between us as human beings and these entities, we, we have we take pleasure in the physical element of that with its mistakes, and that's what it almost highlights it more. It's the yeah. M and the N. Now, these are things that are intrinsically so human. It's, it's fascinating that... Um, a classic example like George Orwell talked about this a lot you know the idea of just throwing things away and, and then in the in the the realm that he you know that he's writing the book in it's collecting antiques is kind of the ultimate kind of dissident rebellion thing to do because it has the reminder of the past and the physical and I think things can be carried through on physical elements that are more than just and I think you've done you you, you erudently put your finger upon it it's not the words conveyed but you can see the thought processes that, that come from the mistakes. And that's the same in yeah. art, it's the same in music. This is where the, it's, I've always, often said it, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on it, but it's the imperfections of us humans that, are, uh, it's kind of, it's one of those unique things that we have as human beings, and it's, it's the mistakes. Like, I, I, you know, I've been to, to see paintings before in galleries, and it's it's when you stare and, and you think, okay, look, I know that if you had the artist in front of me, you'd be like, dude, I know where that mistake is. You know what I mean? And I, would, as an artist, would see that immediately. And it's oh, that, but it's that that makes it more human. Whereas in the clean world we live in, with you know, digital, everything's cleaned up. And it's, it's like I say, it's in that bit of paper with the, with the, with the M's and the N's. You, you, can, you can understand his thought process and get the more of the sense of the human you can ever through anything digital. That's what I'm trying to make my long winded point. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. Um, and my editor asked me, you know, what are you, what are you doing with the drafts? Because I do a lot of, of handwriting. Uh, it's a big part of my process. He said, what are you doing with those handwritten drafts? And I said, I throw them away once I put it in the computer. And he's like, no, stop it. <laughs> you keep those, keep every handwritten thing. And uh, so I started doing that, you know, for that reason. And I guess I just didn't see it that way. But it was one of those, you know, uh, blinding flash of the blatantly obvious sort of uh, revelation that I need to be keeping those things. And uh, so I have started doing that. Yeah, because um, just, just on that one journey as well, one of the great things about doing, keeping, especially when you write something down, you know, from someone who's, I've, I've, I've done a lot of writing down before, especially when I do lyrics and songs, that's a, that's a great example. So you're, 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 you end up editing, um, well, the process I used to work, I used to write song and then, you know, someone else would come and put some music to it, which means you had to, you had to just kind of edit the words down because it's got to fit a certain structure. But if you have the original piece of the lyrics you wrote, the great thing about it is that becomes a time capsule. So you can look at some point in, in the future and go, go, okay, that's how I got to that point. You know, you, 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 you're more focused on, oh yeah, I know the words, but it's the bits on the side. What what little scribble did I make? What what did I cross out? Because they spark off of the creative future thoughts that you can go back and rely on in your own mind that get lost in just a, you know a, a, like I say something being copied or or digitally just put into perfect form. It's the mistakes on the edge that are great for creative people, and I think just as human beings, I think it's a very it's one of those like I said before. It's, it's, like you just said, it's almost a revelatory point that we've, we've kind of overlooked that. And it's those, I mean, it's a per perfect example. It's all the little blueprints and stuff that Da Vinci did that, you know, end up being helicopters and stuff like that because it's just, it's, if they, but if they'd all been lost and we go, oh, we're only going to keep the paint, painting or a fresco or the, the physical, you know, it, that those things get lost. That's, it's fascinating. But 
it's, it's an interesting one about living in this part of the world because there's a lot of old buildings. And what fascinates me when I go to an old building around where I live, and these some of these castles are, you know, literally hundreds upon hundreds of years old. Right. It's not so much the the, the the awe of the architecture and how they got this and how they built and all, all that that you just naturally goes through your mind as a human being when you look at something that's been built in the past. But you go around looking for the little bits that the stonemason, you know, as a, as a, as it would have been, just a normal guy who just knows how to, you know, shape stones. And he's just his little bit of what we call graffiti or his little mark. And that instantly becomes an instant connection with the past, far more than this big, impressive building that's in front of you. Right. No, absolutely. I... I cannot wait to come visit you. It's uh, once I get through this project and get this book out, I absolutely want to come see you. You know, I've never left the country, not once. That's that's in common well, with quite. I gotta that's get in, out of here. That's in com <laughs> That's in common with quite a lot of Americans, though. To be fair. Yeah, I gotta get out of here. I need a break. <laughs> Can you? Um, the the painting behind you is is beautiful. Thank you. That, that's it's uh, kind of a, really kind of a flows in with the conversation because I've um, been asked to do a commission, and the the, the uh, woman who asked me to commission it was kind of it's, it's an interesting process. Is I'll give you an insight into how the artist works. So I I, I have a conversation, and they and they say like she said to me, she said, well, I went on the theme of basically that she saw her father die, and she was struck by how present he was in that moment of death and how present she was of seeing him die and it was she wanted something to convey wow. con convey that and she uh, you know i said i'll just frame a few words and the words she came were um being present death explosion was another word and out of that this is what i'm saying out of that forms artwork and I, this goes back to the connection i've talked about since we've ever, since we first met there is a deep connection between written word music and art that mm -hmm. and i think that and I, i've been really co contemplating that that, that they're, they're kind of like a trinity but they all have unique aspects See, one of the great things i love about art is it's universal you know i could show this to someone in in, in gabon or i could show it to someone in bolivia and they would understand the conveyances you know, for the colors whatever it, it, it hit them on a language they, whereas if, you don't, if, if i put a a passage of Shakespeare because it's in English it doesn't mean anything to them they've got to de decipher that and then you go over the translation to be correct and before you know it you know it's lost but it has a, the words themselves have a great power of, of what we as humans create same with music music can be quite universal but can get lost in you know when you listen to a piece of Indian music or Chinese music you're like okay that's out of my structure of you know normal what I've been conditioned to but okay. but there's a deep connection between the three and this is why i this is how i kind of see it so like that started off as a, as a formation of someone coming to you with an idea a few words out of that mm -hmm. comes a painting i see it as like the next step then is that for that that painting then to inspire someone to create a piece of music or go wow i can take a story from that scene and write backwards or forwards or in any direction and that's the beauty of creation to me it's the idea is that things flow from from one to the other I think you must you must encounter that as a writer as, as well. Oh, absolutely. And um, I have switched up lately the music that I listen to during my writing sessions. Uh, do you remember the movie Five Easy Pieces with Jack yeah. Nicholson? It was done by Bob Rafelson. Um, so Five e Easy Pieces, the title actually refers to five pieces of classical music, uh, you know, five five scores. And so I've made a playlist of those five pieces and um, I'm at a point right now and, and there's, you know, there are a lot of details, there are a lot of facts and, um, you know, trying to make that readable front to back has been a little difficult. So I'm at a point where I can't handle music with words right now. <laughs> I'll get back to it. I have a whole nother playlist, um, you know, of songs that, that fire me up in certain ways and bring me back down. Uh, but music, I mean, music is fuel. That's that's another thing I learned from Hunter Thompson. And so, um, and also visuals, you know, looking at, you know, having a, a painting around, lighting a candle, listening to music. I mean, there's a whole a whole process for me that, that has nothing to do with the pen and paper. You know, I mean, well, it has everything to do with it, but, you know, I have to, I have to set my environment in that way. 
and then I let things like the music and, and the art uh, carry me through, you know, the steps I need to take as a writer. Yes, it's, so one of the one of the things that I've been, I've been contemplating on, just you know, getting to your mindset, of, you know, knowing what I know of you, Jen, and it's something that's gone through my mind. Just thinking about when I've been meditating on it. So you, just in your, which we touched upon briefly, and other people know a lot more probably about you than you know this sort of side of you, is the idea of you know, right. you're doing a lot with with you're seeing some of the most horrific elements that humans can do to each other you know through just yeah. papers you read you know the, it's the interaction you have all the time and you're, you're you're literally interfacing with some of the worst aspects of what we are as a species as human beings now when i was thinking about that that you know that i think a lot of creative people do they need the the energy and stuff and they're very we're very good at kind of my, you know putting things into sections but my question to you is and this is just coming from, from my own mindset, trying to think of you, where you're at. Does, does any of that bleed into any other aspects of your creative, you know, life? Whether it's your dreams, does it create, does it bleed into your dreams? And that you start noticing when you're writing, it's like, wow, I, I, it's just bleeding through here. And if that is the case, how do you as a creative person, what, what strategies do you take to overcome that? you know, bleed that may come through that contain everything you want to do on the other side that you want maybe that's free from that, you know, over overreach of thoughts and processes. What's your what's your what's your strategies of how to overcome that as a creative person? I have a group of very close friends and it you're you're absolutely right. It it absolutely comes through. Uh the victim in the case that I'm writing about comes to me in my dreams on a regular basis and he has for three years. And, um, you know, going in, I thought, you know what? I'm a professional. I can handle this. I can be objective. I can just go in, do my job and, and, and get out, you know? And I, at, in the beginning, I was not uh, prepared for the incredibly uh, dark places that, that writing about this case would, would take me. And so um, in that way, I, you know, that, that close group of friends that I have, um, you know, I received you know, you and I exchange messages, you know, frequently, and uh, and you remind me, you know, that the universe has got our backs, you know, and and um, and 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 I consider you one of those people, so thank you so much for that. But there are people who can, you know, who are outside of my brain, that when I go into these rabbit holes, like I have to for the work, uh, sometimes I forget to come back out. Sometimes, you know, I I lose touch, and um, and and those people can recognize that in me they know me well enough at this point that they can recognize that and come snatch me right back out of my own brain and um without those people i you know who i just you know I, I wasn't prepared for the darkness and um and so that's you know my my support system one of the one of the first couple of sentences in in the book says only a lunatic writes alone it's dangerous work I would, I would counter that by saying, Jen, you know, only a lunatic would work with other people. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm real picky about my people these days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad that I'm I'm writing this book at 46 instead of 26. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, I don't know that 26 year old me could have handled it. And I think I think the other thing, Jen, just you know, no, no one knew from from afar positions I know you from you know, thousands of miles away and I know, I know you're aware of it but it's I think I think you just probably you know speak about it and you probably agree with me that nature does play an element in in keeping that balance and that darkness away I mean I, I know it's like I mean I, I, I have times when you know just, just because of the life you've lived you see some dark stuff or you just you see stuff around you and you think it's just it is it's just darkness and it just is as that you know like like the yin and the yang of the universe the darkness wants to always overcome the light and it just you know that's just the nature of the, the purity of the you know the, the, the literal good and you know bad forces in the world but i've always found when i do get like that and i know it's it's almost become a bit of a cliche but just taking an hour out of my life and just you know you're lucky you've got key lab but what's you know just just going out in nature and and it's amazing that I've, one of the things 
I always find when I go out in nature is it immediately any dark thoughts or any the noise or or the the, 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 the general kind of hubbub of, of, of the world out there from where it may come from from you know from the from the outside external thoughts like the internet or just your interaction with people generally when you're in the middle of a woods or you're an empty whatever it may be out in the nature it's just you and nature itself it it humbles you right down and, and it's kind of like wow actually what if i really what what am i actually getting that overly stressful when ultimately yeah we are just alone on this planet you know there you know if we took all these luxuries we we take away and we didn't have all the inputs of hearing that how often would you, would you never it's that old bill hicks jokes and you look out your window and the birds are singing and you think well where is all this happening but you know it is happening but nature's a great one for if nothing else for balancing down and it's not some magical process where you kind of get enlightened in it it's, it's just a it's almost like a like I say, you're full of all this noise and static energy of, of, the, of the outside world. And nature of nothing else is just like going to a, a, a bath or a, a, a body of water. And you just feel like it just balances you out. And I think maybe on a, on a subconscious level, it, when we are creative, it's what I always try to say to people, try to get out of nature as much as possible. Even if you, I'm not saying it's got some magical effect on you. You come back and you're like, oh wow i can write the sonnets of shakespeare or i can compose some you know opus of a, of a concerto or anything like that no far from it but it's needed from my perspective and i'm sure you you have the same similar thought process of just keeping the balance which is key to a healthy mind and a healthy life right well um like i just uh, stepped outside and uh, i don't know if you can hear you know the change in, in the background but you know, I just wanted to feel the sun on my skin. I'm, I'm under the weather. You know, I'm not feeling well. Um, and, and so I just wanted to feel the sun on my skin. Now, in Virginia, where I've been staying, uh, I'm, I'm out in the country. I, I have, you know, my hound dog, Kilo. He's amazing. Uh, he, he's helped me through a great deal of this as well. Um, but flying here to Colorado Springs last weekend, I had to leave Kilo there with my friends. And, and, and coming outside now, I'm not coming outside, you know, into the country, I'm, I'm in the city. And there's, you know, the sirens and the vehicles and the, you know, uh, you know I'm, I'm still, you know, luckily in Colorado, I'm pretty close to the sun. So, um, you know, the environment is different and getting back to nature is so important to me. Uh, but for this part of the game, I have to be in the city. And um, so, you know, music, art, the sun, all of it, the moon, you know, um, yeah, <laughs> I, I need, I need to reconnect with nature on a regular basis. Well, the great thing is, Jen, even, you know, I, you know, I lived in cities for many years and some bigger cities and, and that's the thing about this, this beautiful planet we live on. There's no part of the, of the world you can live in where you, where, you, where nature won't, you won't find, you'll find it everywhere, you know, you, and that's one of the joys I said, it was one of my little Zen practices I haven't realized I live in a city, was like, okay, I'm, I'm on the hunt today for just, you know, what the ant's doing, what the, because you, you'll see it, and it, it almost becomes like a Zen process of thinking, okay, what are my little 50 yard square foot of concrete can I find this you know, nature, and that gives, which I always, the lesson I always took away from that was like how resilient life itself is. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's always, always cheers my soul when I know that yeah, life itself is, is resilient. Right. I was actually talking to squirrels this morning. <laughs> <laughs> they were, um, they, they were running along the, the top of the fence and they were fighting with each other and, you know, running circles around a tree and, you know, really upset with each other. <laughs> and as they ran by, I mean, they weren't paying attention to me at all. And as they ran by along the fence, I spoke to them and they both stopped in their tracks. And they stopped fighting. <laughs> they stopped fighting when I started talking to them. Um, and it was just, I don't know, it was just a really touching moment for me out here talking to the squirrels. Yeah, and I'm doing it. That's, that's the other one, Jenny. It's always, it's always a, that's what I'm saying, there's always lessons to learn from that. I mean, I'm, I'm just hearing that story there thinking, that's almost like a Zen lesson in like, well, life itself, yeah, you, people do get in, they get in, entangled in, you know, even down to the universal level of a squirrel. Again, it's been shown, <laughs> it's, it's running around, it's arguing, sure, right? but when it sort of is jolted out of its reality, it, even the squirrel, go, actually, what, what, what are we doing? Actually, it's more important than the human talking to us. That That's more of, a, <laughs> of our day made than just having it. And it's, it's always, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, we, I think we've become, in this world, we've become 
very easy to become detached from we are just on this rock that's literally you know <laughs> in the middle of a, an empty universe and the, right. the this great beautiful thing we live on is is such a a, a, a joyous ride and it's such a and that's what i was trying to get trying to sort of d dig a bit about you know you see all the darkness of the world and stuff like that which is part of the i always sort of think well, as much as, as the darkness it always makes the lighter things and the more beauty of things even more illuminating and how precious that is you know like like how fortunate we are to live in the times we are right now and we're not being bombs flying over our heads and you know and it, we just and this is we can, we can just have this conversation these are things if you look back in like i was trying to say when you look at a castle you know an old building you think well there's been plenty of centuries where that's not been you know we haven't had the ability to sit there and open up to each other and have a conversation across continents that's that's such a a thing that can be taken for granted but it's so unique and special to the lifetimes we're living right now yes yes If you can hear that in the background or not but uh, i'm staying at an airbnb and they have chickens so even being able to hear the you know the city chickens <laughs> they, they're talking to me as well <laughs> exactly yeah exactly and i, I mean I'll just and i kind of and it's, it's a brief one but it's something it's house has been going through through my my mind and it's not like thinking about what you've been doing so we, we've seen in the last sort of three months and it's sort of public being turned up you know out to the public about you know the artificial intelligence so like the chat boxes like chat gdp or you know there's, there's various ones and there's ones with art and music and stuff like that and then now you know you sort of see you see it seeping into sort of like the public domain of, of deep fake videos and deep fake everything right. else now i'm i mean you can have this discussion about you know how that's going to shape us as human beings because you know that's that's the whole number of discussion i arrived but i'll focus it down to what you're doing it's hard enough i'd imagine right now and that and you you know it's more about me to deal with, with with cases that are going in front of a human jury and there's all the complexes about what's hidden what's not hidden and all that kind of stuff what what at what point does where does this intersect with with like with deep fake videos and deep fake the ability for you know literally people to fake evidence fake videos and stuff where, where does that bleed into and are the people that are sort of in your that that kind of field that you're in are they discussing this because to me this could have fundamental issues with justice itself because you know if, if we're dealing with something that's unsort of seen before in in human history the idea that you can literally find it hard to distinguish between what is real and unreal because it's on the screen and uh, that and that intersection when it comes to actually people's lives and imprisonment you know that that to me was like a bit of a you know kind of like i say my head went on a bit of a a very deep rabbit hole with that and i was wondering here to hear your thoughts yeah no that that's it's incredibly valid um for example this case that i'm writing about now the defendant did not want a jury trial she wanted a, a bench trial where the judge would hear the case and the judge would make the decision as far as the verdict goes. Um, because, and, and I don't know this for sure, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm speculating her reasoning, um, but if I were in those shoes, um, you know, there are gonna be 12, you know, 12, uh, you know, a jury of your peers, but you don't know their backgrounds and, and they're making decisions um, you know, based on, the, it's supposed to be, you know, on evidence, but emotions play a big part. And, and in this case, um, you know, the victim was very young. That's, you know, so you're going to have parents, you're going to have mothers, you're going to have fathers, you're going to have, you know, um, people who are going to have to see some really horrible things. And they're not used to it, where the judge has seen, you know, all of the worst evidence in so many cases. Um, and so I under, I mean, it makes sense that she would want a, a bench trial, um, but she is going to have a, a jury trial and, and they're going through jury selection now and I'm listening to it every day. And, um, you know, so many people just said, I, I can't be, you know, I think she's guilty now and I haven't even heard any evidence. I can't, I, I can't handle this. I can't handle sitting on this jury. Um, so they are, they are going through 
uh, 75 a day and, um, and, and, and choosing people, uh, but that jury is going to have to be, you know, really tough. And, 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 you know, the book that I'm writing is not about the, the defendant, you know, as much as I'm sure she would like that. Um, you know, it's not about her. It's about due process and the criminal justice system. And it's about open source intelligence in the court of public opinion. And, and that's really, you know, what, what you were talking about. Um, you know, we have access to all of this information, but who's vetted it, you know? Um, and so that's why I'm working with, you know, PIs and attorneys and, you know, I'm really just documenting me getting all of my questions answered. Um, but uh, if I were a defendant, I would be concerned about a jury because we see it over and over and over again where people are wrongfully convicted. Um, you know, I, I just, but at the same time, you know, the fact that we have jury trials is, you know, a testament to the Constitution. And, uh, you know, in, in a lot of countries, it's up to the government to decide. And I don't know that I would necessarily want that either. Mm. So I'm learning a lot about that very thing. Yeah, it comes down to because I mean, it's sometimes quite a longer conversation, but you know, it, it'd be so easily, definitely within, within two or three years, where you could sit, sit down and you know, in front with a chat box and say to him, right, I want you to fake me a video of like person X being from a police cam point of view. You can see that you know it's all for all, all shot from that point of view going up and you see this person there and they've just done the most horrific you know, me, you know physical crime to someone else and that's that could you know what i mean right and you see that you know you think well yeah, that's what i'm saying is it, i haven't got a clue i haven't got an answer to it and i i the reason i like to sort of i'm, I'm trying to sort of encourage this conversation is like i don't want to I think it's important to us as human beings just, just even just to be aware of what what's just around the corner well mm -hmm. yeah because it's ultimately it's it's a neutral it's just technology but it's going to be what we as humans how we interact with that how we do it it's, there's a myriad of questions and if we just ignore it i think that's kind of just putting our hands in the sand and, and hoping for the best and i don't think with this kind of technology it's just creeping into our lives we, that's a good position to be in that's my personal thought yeah, no, I agree. Um, back in 1997, I worked for a company called Digital Archaeology, and that's exactly what it was. You know, back then we were uh, collecting data, warehousing it, and then mining it, and then using that for e-commerce analytics to predict people's spending habits. You know, I I started that job as a receptionist and and quickly, you know, moved moved up through the ranks. But I, even back then, even working for a company called Digital Archaeology in 1997, I didn't understand what was really going down. And, and today, I look around and I'm like, oh man, that's, that's what we were doing. And, um, you know, we are the future of AI. Uh, it, it, it is molded on, on our behaviors and, and what we do, and we are so easily fooled. And, um, you know, as, as the technology grows in strength and... Uh, and slickness um, you know the the smarter our phones get the dumber we get and and that is absolutely by design so it is scary yeah well jen i've just seen that the the clock is running down this so that's okay. that rushing is to an end uh, before we go just just quickly and i mean you know as brief as you want to make it but just let people know about your kickstarter and, and I'll let you have the final word and, and say thank you for giving me your time. It's been another illuminating conversation. So I'll let you have the final word. Always, yeah. So on the Kickstarter, I decided to do that because, you know, unlike, you know, a GoFundMe or, or donations where, um, you know, people are just kind of giving money to support you, this is, you know, it's an, it's an inner, it's a transactional, you know, thing. So basically you can pre-order a signed copy of the book um, which, which would help me a, a great deal. Um, so I do have that Kickstarter and there are links to it on my website, which is crimecurious.com. You know, if you're into that sort of thing, um, it's crimecurious.com. And then from there you can get to my YouTube videos and, and all that stuff. But 
Thank you so much. It's always good to talk to you. I feel like I've reconnected with the universe this morning and I'm already feeling better physically. So thank you. Beautiful. Well, I would say life is people, people. Well, they say that life is people and that people are angels and that angels are devils and the devils are me and you.